This week, on the A-Push Show, we look at Chapter 17, Industrial Supremacy. We'll be looking at the sources of industrial growth. What allowed the United States to grow so industrially into like a mighty plant of industrialism? Was it the people? Was it the land? Was it the water? We'll look at capitalism and its critics. What do people have against capitalism? Did it say something mean about their mom? And lastly, we'll look at industrial workers in the new economy. How did industrial workers fare in the new economy? Did they fare well or did they fare not so well? Was it really fair for the industrial workers of the new economy? All this and more this week on The 8 Push Show. understand industrial dominance you really have to understand the sources of industrial growth at the time and understand that the United States was especially primed to become an especially dominant industrial country at the time. The United States had pretty much every single piece of industrial growth in massive numbers. One, the U.S. had a whole continent of resources. There was abundant oil, coal, iron, cotton, corn, wheat, wood, livestock, and almost every commodity one could need to be a very large and powerful industrial nation. Two, the United States had a huge labor supply thanks to a massively increasing population at that time. Birth rates were incredibly high and so were the numbers of immigrants migrating into the country desperate for work. Three, there was also an entrepreneurial class of owners that were as talented as they were also ruthless and ambitious, which could be both good and bad things. And you also had a government willing to bend over backwards to assist the growth of business, quite often at the expense of regular people. Industry grew in large part due to innovations in the production of steel. Loads of railroads, railroad cars, and large buildings made with massive steel beams and girders would help the nation grow, and those who could supply the steel for this massive project better and more cheaply than anyone else stood to profit immensely. Two early innovators in the steel production game were Englishman Henry Bessemer and American William Kelly, who both developed almost simultaneously the process for converting coal and iron into steel. Ultimately, the name Bessemer becomes the name associated with steel production, but we won't get too much into the nitty-gritty of steel production, as Taft and I are both woefully ignorant of the steel production process and all the chemistries that go behind it. What do you know about steel production, Taft? (coughs) Areas around the Great Lakes, particularly in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio, would become centers of steel production. One, they had huge supplies of coal, which was essential for the production of steel. Two, there were already large networks of railroads to connect supplies and people to steel production centers, which in turn also expanded these rail networks tremendously. Three, the lakes themselves would prove to be ideal for transporting large amounts of steel, as it's a lot easier sometimes to transport very heavy things like steel over water as it is over land. Because of its prime location, Pittsburgh became the center of steel production in the United States and still has a large degree of its own identity associated with the production of steel. Go Stillers! Right, Taft? In addition to the production of steel came the production of oil. At first, oil was used only as a lubricant and not fuel, but the demand for oil to lubricate the machines that made industrialism work quickly allowed oil producers to make staggering amounts of money. Those who could successfully suckle the earth's dark milk supped in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, and in turn found themselves amassing profound degrees of wealth and influence. You'll notice that Taft has decided to relocate himself to the history book, as this semester he is going to be on the books. Taft, are you going by the book? Interestingly enough, the two means of transportation that would largely replace railroads as the primary means of land transport in the United States would be developed during this time. Of course, I'm talking about airplanes and automobiles. 
We'll start with automobiles. Automobiles, as we know, run on gasoline engines, and gas engines could not be a thing until gasoline was discovered. During the process of taking crude oil, which is the oil straight from the earth, and separating lubricating oil from fuel oil, gasoline was discovered. Thanks to innovations from German inventors like Nicholas August Otto and his employee Gottfried Daimler, as well as many others, an engine that ran on gasoline would emerge in the mid to late 1800s. The American automobile would expand dramatically in the wake of these inventions. In 1896, inventor and outspoken racist Henry Ford would develop the first of his automobiles that would bear his name. The American landscape would be changed forever as the number of cars that matriculated America's highways would explode from four, that is the number four, in 1895 to nearly 5 million in 1917. Around the same time, the Wright brothers would achieve what humans had dared to achieve since the first human eye laid sight upon the first bird in the sky, human flight. Bicycle sales and repairmen by trade, the Wright brothers constructed the first self-propelled gliding aircraft, which they were able to fly for 120 feet in 12 seconds at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903. A year later, they were able to fly a glider 23 miles and began to take passengers on their flights. The era of the aircraft was born. As inventions became increasingly lucrative, massive American corporations began to fund their own research and development. Corporate research and development came at a critical time when government funding for scientific research and development began to decline. Formerly academic in nature, research became tied to the desire to attain more corporate wealth and thusly became more decentralized. We see the motivation of research pivot sharply towards the ultimate purpose of making a profit as opposed to further understanding of the world. Naturally, many researchers began to express fear regarding the commercial direction research and development had taken, but never before had research and development in higher education been so closely tied to practical necessity. One could argue that though research was heavily commercial, it led to developments that closely tied to real human application. Now, whether or not these inventions would improve the overall human condition is certainly ripe for discussion or debate. One of the many areas that research and development targeted was the science of production, that is, the science of making stuff. Taylorism was named for production theoretician Frederick Taylor and became somewhat synonymous with the science of production. It's basically the idea that it's more practical and efficient to break down complex tasks into simpler, smaller tasks. Instead of having one guy build a chassis for a car in 12 hours, you can train many workers to perform each of the many tasks to build a chassis. And if these workers are organized in such a way that each can perform the task in rapid succession, like in an assembly line, the chassis can be built very quickly. Henry Ford would perfect the moving assembly line, which would allow the Ford company to produce more cars more quickly and more cheaply. In Ford's case, this allowed the finished product to be sold at a much cheaper price, and since the process is more efficient, workers didn't have to work as long and could get paid more. But no matter how many cars Henry Ford built, the railroad was still king in American transport. In many ways, railroads would lead the way for American development as railroad construction would expand the nation's rail network sixfold between 1860 and 1900. These railroads would be built by scores of workers, many of them immigrating laborers, which would be financed by private, local, state, federal, and foreign sources, but would be largely controlled by an extraordinarily wealthy and privileged few. Railroad development would impact nearly all aspects of American life. As railroads were built, trees that stood in the way would be cut down and turned to lumber, Buffalo that stood in the way would be nearly exterminated as a species. Native Americans who stood in the way would also be nearly exterminated. Cities like Chicago that stood where railroad networks converged would experience astonishingly rapid growth. Even time itself was transformed by railroads, as the standardization of time would emerge largely as a railroad necessity. 
It's really hard to make a train schedule if everyone is operating on their own sun-based interpretation of what time of day it is. Before railroads, the time of day could be different depending on what city you lived in, even if those cities were right next to each other. But of course, financing these massive industrial projects cost a lot of money, usually more money than what the industrial capitalists had on hand, so they had to get pretty creative in terms of how they came up with more money. Taft, do you not want to talk about industrial capitalism and prefer to look in the corner of the room? Well, okay then. Out of this necessity to provide more capital for these massive projects, the business corporation, as we now understand it, became solidified. For businesses that worked in railroad, steel, oil, meatpacking, or other industries, in order to finance their enterprise, they needed lots of money. Money they didn't necessarily have lying around. To do this, they would sell larger and larger shares of stock in their company. The company's status as a limited liability company, or LLC, would allow those who own shares in the company to only be responsible for the cost of the share when they bought it. Though the practice of selling shares in a company actually began in the 1830s and 1840s, its widespread use didn't come into play until after the Civil War. Railroad companies would be the first to adopt this corporate strategy, but it would soon spread to other industries as well. Andrew Carnegie would use this method in his steel industry as he would sell stock in his steel manufacturing company to help broker deals with railroad companies and also to acquire coal mines as well as sources of iron ore. As these sort of companies grew and grew into national institutions, a need for a new type of manager emerged to help keep these giant corporations functional. A national corporation has many employees, many machines, and many resources that have to be put to use in an efficient manner in order to keep the business organized. An arranged company hierarchy as well as set business protocols became necessary. Also a class of middle management, that is workers who functioned as links between workers and management, became necessary as well. Here we see corporations becoming sort of organized like feudal nations as the leaders of corporations could rule over their corporate kingdoms with mere impunity. What allowed these corporate kingdoms to grow was consolidation, which is basically when a company either merges or takes over another company if it is willing and able to do so. There are two types of consolidation, horizontal integration and vertical integration. We use John D. Rockefeller as our example of both horizontal and vertical integration since he did both. Horizontal integration is when a company takes over other competing companies that do the same thing. For example, if there are many oil companies, but one is able to buy out a few other oil companies, that's horizontal consolidation. Rockefeller did this shortly after opening his first refining company in Cleveland. He would buy out much of his competition in Cleveland as well as in other places throughout the Midwest and the East. Vertical integration is when you own all of the aspects of your business. Take oil, for example. Oil has to be extracted from the ground, transported to refineries, refined into various products, and then those products have to be marketed and sold to the public. Rockefeller's standard oil company was able to integrate vertically as he would own his oil fields, build his own barrel factories, his own warehouses, his own refineries, and his own oil pipelines. Because of his ability to integrate his company horizontally and vertically, Rockefeller's standard oil company would control nearly 90% of the oil consumed in the United States. Consolidation was seen by many corporate giants like Rockefeller as a means of eliminating the cutthroat nature of business at the time. It was sort of a Pax Romana type of approach to business and that the only way to achieve peace was to ruthlessly eliminate all competition and allow one company to control everything. Consolidation would also emerge in the pool arrangement. A pool arrangement was when various corporations within an industry would make an agreement on things like who controlled which markets and what rates or prices everybody would agree to use. Nowadays, if all members of an industry agree to fix markets and prices, we call that collusion, we call those companies a cartel, and we call that illegal in this country. But back then it was legal, but still most of these pool arrangements failed because of the dynamic nature of business as well as the ruthless and brutal nature of most businessmen at the time. Though most pools were unsuccessful, the very similar trusts were incredibly successful. Trusts came to be an agreement where stockholders turned the control of their stock in a company over to trustees 
who would use the combined stock holdings of many companies to take advantage of the business market. It was kind of like a congress of companies, and the people who made the decisions for the trust were known as trustees. In 1889, the state of New Jersey made it legal for companies to buy other companies, and thus the corporate merger was born in the United States. Now a company could buy another company and control all of that company. This would eliminate the need for trust, as now a company could just buy out other companies if it was willing and able. Standard Oil was one of those companies, as they would relocate to New Jersey, establish a holding company there, which is basically a corporate headquarters for a company to buy out other companies and expand. With trusts and holding companies, rapid corporate consolidation ensued. The economic direction of the country would become increasingly in the hands of a very wealthy and powerful few. Some began to wonder if this was best for the nation, as though these economic developments created massive avenues of growth in terms of jobs, products people could now purchase, and huge improvements in national infrastructure, putting such a staggeringly large amount of control in the hands of a few men who had no accountability to the masses they now controlled, alarmed more than a few people. And these alarms naturally lead us to a discussion on capitalism and its critics. Now, in case you don't remember, capitalism is an economic system in which all the goods and services of a society are supposed to be regulated only by a market, meaning the only thing that determines the price of a product or the wage of a service is competition and the willingness of the buyer. The U.S., like many industrialized nations in the late 19th and early 20th century, was hyper-capitalist, and some began to worry that the huge amounts of power and wealth held by these massively wealthy industrialists would be the undoing of American democracy and perhaps the idea of the free and independent American identity. Industrialists would perpetuate the belief that their positions of power and wealth not only reflected the American spirit, but strengthened the American spirit. Many would claim that they were self-made men, meaning their wealth was earned through discipline, hard work, and intelligence. For some, this was sort of the case, such as Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller, who both came from somewhat modest beginnings. But for many of the various millionaires of this era, the self-made man was nothing more than a myth to distract or placate the masses. Many millionaires acquired their wealth through inheritance, family connections to a greater means of wealth, or through rampant corruption of elected officials at the local, state, and national levels. To justify the excesses of the upper class, the myth of the self-made man was further supported by the idea of social Darwinism. As you may remember, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution hinges on the idea of the survival of the fittest, meaning an animal species survives if it is fit enough to survive and reproduce. Social Darwinists would apply that same principle to society as they would claim they achieved their wealth because they were socially more fit and able to acquire wealth than everyone else. The justification of the status quo was founded on applying a theory of evolution within the natural world to the social world. It made parallels between human economic forces and natural forces, as it made the claim that just as laws of nature are all powerful and cannot be trifled with, so too are laws of economics like supply and demand. Wealthy capitalists would claim that any attempt to subvert the free market to any person's will was doomed to fail, just as any person who tries to submit natural law to his or her will is also doomed to fail. This, of course, was a big, fat, stinking cat turd of a lie, as many capitalists would try and eliminate the free market once they were on top of it. Why else would one try and buy out all the other companies, create trusts, or consolidate to such a degree that true market competition was impossible? The free market was really only as free as wealthy capitalists were able to allow it to be free. Taft, your thoughts? You would say that, you corporate fat cat. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. A more gentle approach taken by the wealth apologists was the idea of the gospel of wealth. The gospel of wealth was actually the title of a book written by Andrew Carnegie, who was actually a truly self-made man. He wrote that the wealthy have a moral responsibility to invest any excess wealth they earn beyond what they need back into the community to help the less fortunate. 
Carnegie would actually sort of do this as he invested heavily in providing education via schools and libraries, but unfortunately he was sort of the only guy to do this. Along the same idea of wealth being seen as an achievable asset came the ideas presented by Russell Conwell and Horatio Alger. Conwell, whose name unfortunately would indicate a life of successful scam artistry, was actually a Baptist minister who promoted the idea of Acres of Diamonds, which was essentially a sermon that preached a message that wealth was in our own backyards. It was the idea that the means of wealth is within all of us if we can just find and use it. Horatio Alger was also a minister until he stepped down due to a sex scandal that nearly revealed that he was a homosexual, which was a sexual orientation that was not acceptable to Americans at the time. However, Alger found huge success in writing novels about desperately poor boys who through luck, determination, and intelligence were able to move up to positions of wealth and prestige. Both Conwell and Alger perpetuated the idea of wealth representing an achievable and worthy aim for members of the capitalist society which somewhat supported Carnegie's idea of using wealth for the improvement of society. But others were not so complementary for the excesses of capitalism as alternative visions of America's capitalist society would emerge, much more critical versions. Writers like Lester Frank Ward would argue that civilizations were not forged by natural selection, but by human intelligence and planning. He wrote in his books that human planning via the government made civilizations prosper. In the same spirit of these radical ideas comes Henry George, who wrote in his 1879 book Progress and Poverty that a society cannot claim to be progressing as long as there exists extreme poverty. George would advocate for a single tax to be placed on all pieces of property that increased in value as land value increases as a result of society's progress more so than an individual's effort. He almost became mayor of New York as a result of his theories and the support he received from several unions and working class parties. Lastly, we look at the sci-fi novel Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. Published in 1888, the book features a utopian look at the year 2000 in which human society has progressed through an evolutionary process and the government, through the will of the people, controls all businesses and everyone has what they want and need and everyone gets along. Society function as a sort of mechanical paradise, and Bellamy would call this theory nationalism. And as one who was alive in the year 2000, I can tell you that that is pretty much exactly what life was like in the year 2000. But these anti-capitalist visions of the world were not held by most Americans. Americans were not ready to be overly critical of capitalism, but they were ready to challenge the notion of monopolies. A monopoly is when one company controls everything, and this freaked a lot of people out. People would argue that if a monopoly existed, a company would raise prices as there would be no competition to drive prices down. This would also lead to an unstable economy as production often was higher than demand because prices in various industries went up and down erratically. Economic recessions seemed to occur regularly as the volatile economy ruined many who aspired to attain wealth. However, the major worry was increasing inequality. As the gap between rich and poor grew, so did increased hostilities between these two groups. As those who struggled to make ends meet saw the opulent spending of the Vanderbilt, the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, among others, class resentment and hostility grew and grew. Only 1% of the nation's families controlled nearly 88% of the nation's wealth. As people struggled to provide for themselves and their families, it became increased increasingly difficult to determine which was more powerful, the people's resentment towards the obscenely wealthy or their fear of poverty. But enough about capitalism and industrial fat cats, let's talk about the workers, eh comrades? You would be you. Cat. It's a bit of a tricky issue discussing the plight of industrial workers during this era because on the one hand, their standard of living improved tremendously during this period, but the amount of work they had to do compared to the more privileged classes was terribly unfair, and not to mention the difference in quality of living between the rich and poor was larger than it had ever been in the country before. Whether or not the plight of the working class was better or worse during industrialism than it was before industrialism is a difficult question to answer, but nonetheless, the increased feelings of alienation and powerlessness felt by the working class led to intense calls for reform. 
Waves of immigrants came to the United States as they had before the Civil War, except in much greater numbers. Nearly four times as many immigrants arrived between 1865 and 1915 than the 50 years previous. And many were coming from new places. You still had a large number of immigrants coming from the traditional places like the United Kingdom, Ireland and Northern Europe, but now you had Southern Europeans, Eastern Europeans, Latin Americans, and Asians coming as well. And as these new groups arrived, heightened ethnic tensions emerged as the new immigrants would be used by industrial capitalists as cheap replacement labor for those who weren't willing to work for less. The type of tensions weren't at all new in the sense that immigrants had been exploited by factory owners for years to drive down wages, but the types of people that were now being used were new as immigrants arrived from places like Poland, Italy, Russia, Eastern Europe, China, and Mexico. But thank goodness the United States doesn't use immigrant labor to drive down prices and subvert union membership anymore, right Taft? Oh. But what upset workers more so than anything else was well, the work that they had to do. Wages remained relatively stagnant and oftentimes well below what would be determined to be a comfortable wage at the time. Because of scientific management and tailorism, work became incredibly monotonous and dull as workers performed the same easy, tedious tasks all day, nearly every day. Not only that, but work was often very inconsistent. Layoffs were frequent as the market was incredibly volatile. Many workers felt a loss of control and a loss of pride in their work. As more work became unskilled, capitalists saw opportunity in putting women and children to work. From a management side, women and children workers were immensely beneficial as they would work for less and they could do the work as the work required minimal training because it was unskilled. This would help keep wages down for all workers but would raise objections as many saw problems in making women work. However, most of these objections were rooted in patriarchal notions of only men should work rather than the exploitive nature of how women worked. The women who did work were terribly paid. Most women who worked were young immigrants who worked predominantly in the textile industry. They were often paid well below the level necessary for survival and well below their male counterparts. In addition to women, nearly 1.7 million children under the age of 16 were put to work in factories, fields, and mines by 1900. Families desperate for additional sources of income would put children under the age of 15 to work full-time. Though child labor laws that prohibited employing children full-time were enacted by 38 states in the late 19th century, laws were rarely enforced. Conditions for men, women, and children on the job were often incredibly dangerous. Workers would regularly get maimed and killed on the job, and compensation for their injuries or loss of life were almost never paid. As late as 1907, nearly 12 men a week died working on the railroads alone. In order to try and fight these wretched working conditions, labor leaders attempted to organize on a large scale. Small-scale trade unions had existed since before the Civil War, but their size could could not match the size, wealth, and influence of the industrial capitalists. The first attempt to forge a national organization of unions came with the National Labor Union in 1866. This was a large organization of many unions that eventually folded after the Panic of 1873. By the 20th century, unions had failed to make even modest gains in achieving respectable rights for workers. The middle class still instinctively believed that any time violence broke out in a labor dispute, it was either the fault of the workers or radical agents who influenced the workers. The National Labor Union also excluded women as they claimed a woman's fear is in the home. The Molly Maguires, who were a particularly militant group of poll workers in Pennsylvania, they had no issue with using threats of violence as a means of intimidation. However, much of the violence attributed to the Mollies was instigated or performed by agents of mine owners in order to make the Mollies look radical and violent. But the violence of the Molly Maguires could not match the violence seen in the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. The strike began when Eastern Railroads announced a 10% cut in wages. Striking railroad workers would then disrupt rail service from St. Louis all the way to Baltimore as they destroyed equipment and rioted in the streets of major cities. A near class war broke out as state militia would be called in various states including Maryland and Pennsylvania where troops would open fire on strikers and their families. 
Over 100 people died and the strike was a failure. The strike showed the depth of resentment workers had towards their employers and the governments that supported them. It also showed the fragility of the labor movement at the time as the failure of the strike of 1877 would weaken the ability of labor leaders to make even modest gains for their workers. But the first truly national labor organization would emerge in the Noble Order of the Knights of Labor, or the Knights of Labor for short. A longtime secret organization like the Masons, the Knights of Labor extended membership to all who toiled, including women, but excluding lawyers, bankers, liquor dealers, and professional gamblers. The inclusion was successful to a degree as the organization boasted over 700,000 members in 1886. However, failure to achieve victory in various struggles against the Gould Railroad system would prove the undoing of the Knights of Labor as the organization dissolved by the start of the 20th century. Before the dissolution of the Knights of Labor, a rival organization would emerge in the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL. The AFL initially took a different approach than the Knights of Labor. Whereas the Knights of Labor was open to all who toiled, the AFL was targeted more for skilled laborers and was openly opposed to female employment. AFL leadership believed that female workers would undermine their efforts since they worked for less. The AFL felt that if women stayed home and out of the workforce, better wages and working conditions for men could be achieved and the sanctity and health of the American family would be restored. This, of course, was all false, but still the AFL advocated for better working conditions for females, even if it was to drive up wages in order to make women less attractive for employers. So thanks, AFL for your backwards and patriarchal support of women's rights in the labor force, I guess? What do you think, Taft? Nonetheless, the AFL stood for a more equal relationship between workers and management. They wished to keep the government out of it as they feared the government could change its mind. The AFL sought to use collective bargaining as its primary tool, but was ready to use strikes if necessary. In the Haymarket Square riot of 1886, we see a bit of a turning point in American labor history. On May 1, 1886, the AFL had called for a national strike in an effort to gain the 8-hour workday. Before that, workers often worked 10 to 12-hour workdays. In the wake of this day of national striking and demonstrating, tensions would mount in the city of Chicago. Chicago at this time had been growing tremendously, and as more and more workers came in, so did abuses from industrial capitalists, which meant that radical elements within the labor movement would also emerge. A strike against the McCormick Harvester Company resulted in state-sponsored violence, as the Chicago police had been harassing labor organizers and actually shot four strikers to death the day before the Haymarket Square incident. Incident occurred. During the ensuing protest meeting at Haymarket Square the next day, a bomb was thrown into the crowd, killing seven officers and injured 67 people. The police then fired into the crowd and killed four more people. That's a total of eight people over the course of two days. The incident scared the hell out of the American middle class, who demanded justice against the strikers. As a result, eight anarchists were rounded up and seven of the eight were sentenced to death, even though there was no conclusive evidence that a single one of them were responsible for the bomb. Four would be executed, one committed suicide in prison, and two would have their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. Haymarket would be a point in which America would rather give in to its fears of radicalism and anarchism, terms few Americans truly bothered to understand, rather than empathize with the plight of the worker. Organized labor would suffer another crippling defeat nearly a decade later in the Homestead Strike. The powerful amalgamated association of iron and steel workers had for years been able to gain workplace concessions due to the fact that they were a skilled labor organization and thus had more leverage over their employers. But improvements in the steel manufacturing processes enabled steel owners, especially Andrew Carnegie, to effectively weaken the amalgamated to the point of near irrelevancy. The last stand occurred in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Carnegie sent his right-hand man, Henry Clay Frick, to destroy the Amalgamated through negotiations. As negotiations soured, the Amalgamated called for a strike. Frick hired agents of a notorious private detective agency called the Pinkertons to come and break the strike. An intensely violent standoff ensued with fires being set, shots being fired, and dynamite being 
blown up. All in all, three agents and ten strikers would be killed. The Pinkertons would surrender, but the Pennsylvania governor would then call in the militia. Defeated and humiliated, the amalgamated returned to work and never recovered. The union would decline to a small fraction of what it once was. A company-created town, Pullman was the home of workers who worked for the Pullman Palace Car Company, which made special luxury cars for passenger trains. Workers lived in apartments rented out by the company, but when wages were cut but not rent payments, workers demanded action. They would call upon militant railway union leader Eugene V. Debs for assistance. Debs was able to call upon a massive nationwide railroad strike in which workers from 27 states would walk off the job, effectively paralyzing the railroads. When Illinois governor and known labor sympathizer John Peter Altgeld refused to give in to the demands of the Organization of Railroad Owners, the federal government stepped in and abruptly ended the strike and arrested Debs. Yet again, we see government swiftly siding against the efforts of organized labor in the favor of management. And though labor achieved some modest victories in winning legislation on eight-hour workdays for some specific government projects, most victories were left unachieved, and the few victories that had been achieved proved to be hollow prizes as they were rarely enforced. Labor suffered due to a few key weaknesses. One, much of the labor in the country was still unorganized. By 1900, only 4% of the workers in the country were organized. Two, the workforce often shifted from place to place. Immigrant workers often believed they would work for a while in the United States, then return to their home countries. Other workers often moved frequently from place to place looking for work, rarely setting down roots, and rarely seeing the need to join an organized labor union. Three, some workers believed, and a small few rightfully so, that they could escape the working class or that their children could. Though a few were able to ascend to the middle class, the statistics would suggest that the overwhelming majority of workers stayed on the same rung of the social ladder, as did their children. Four, the strength of corporate power was far greater than the working class at that time. Industrial capitalists simply had too much money, too much organization, and too many resources that allowed them to crush the efforts of workers. They also had the power of the United States government, as well as state and local governments, which would side with capitalists over and over again at the expense of the American working class. And that wraps up our discussion of Chapter 17. Tune in next time as we look at the American City. On behalf of William Howard Taft and myself, I want to thank you guys for watching and don't forget, we got to keep pushing G.